Okay, we are House Education on April 10th, 2024. We're going to look at S191, an act relating to New Americans' educational grant opportunities. So, uh, committee, um, we've we've had a walkthrough of the bill previously with Senator Hashim. Uh, what we're going to hear today is some proposed language to amend it. It goes back to a discussion we were having earlier about how to assure that residents of Vermont have access to admission, residential admission and um, services for residents through VSAC uh, with that, regardless of um, residential status. Uh, and so we're gonna have a presentation on some uh, language which uh, I'd say is germane to 191 and uh, is the result of some hard work by a lot of people and looking forward to the testimony. Welcome and uh, we'll have you go first and then Legislative Council. Great, thank you. Yeah, so uh, I really appreciate this opportunity. Thank you, Chair Conlin, and thank you to the committee for having me. Um, so yes, the proposed amendment you is- to give us your formal introduction. What's that? You oh. to introduce yourself. Leonora Dodge. Uh, Rep from Essex. Is that good? That's good. <laughs> Aquarius. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so thank you for for explaining kind of what what the amendment is is about. Um, expanding a little bit um, the language um, in our current statutes that speak one of them about VSAC, one about. Um, in-state and residency um, eligibility for in-state tuition uh, for UVM and another one for Vermont State Colleges. And so um, you will walk through the language, but I'm just gonna give you with, with um, your wonderful ledge council, but I will just sort of give you a background um, on the bill, um, on this amendment. Um, so the story behind this proposal is um, started in the summer when um, a few reps were approached by um, folks in who, who work with a lot of the migrant population in the state. And they were hearing a lot of uh, stories of um, frustration of either young adults or high schoolers who um, were facing uh, financial barriers in accessing higher education in our state. Uh, some of them were choosing to leave or to not study, not not go on into into college beyond high school, um, and you know, I I did some more digging. Um, I spoke with folks at Migrant Justice. I spoke with um, CASAN, which is the Chittenden Asylum Seeking Assistance Network, um, Spectrum Youth Services, um, that has a. Uh, position that's devoted specifically to migrant youth. Um, and the, the coordinator in that position, Zainab Kuyate, actually uh, said that happened to her, that she um, arrived here. She had refugee status, but she couldn't um, uh, access, you know, the, the v or, or she was in, in uh, pipeline to, to getting asylum or whatnot. In any case, her lack of documentation that was the way that they currently do things um, made it really, really challenging. So, you know, the reality is that we're balancing a lot of needs. So there's the institutional needs and there's the needs of the folks who, who need to get uh, financial assistance, both by lowering tuition rates and by um, accessing the exact um, financial aid. Um, oh, and we also spoke with uh, folks at AALV, which is like a, a organization that started out as helping um, uh, asylees from Africa, and now they work with other, other groups as well. Um, so we kind of picked up on these common themes of like fear of having to divulge a migratory status that is, you know, undocumented, um, a lot of misinformation, like, you know, in speaking with the institutions, it turned out that they did admit students and they tried to help them, but um, there was a lot of fear and misinformation. And then the reality was that even if you did get admitted, even if an institution decided you met the eligibility for residence and you got a, a lower um, in-state rate, you could not access any VSAC funding. So as we all can imagine, um, if you're a first or second generation student and you don't get any access to any VSAC aid, it's still gonna be tough, even at an in-state rate to access higher education. Um, so 
I'll get to the kind of the, the overall portrait of um, why this is important. And I'll just quickly share some data from um, gathered from the Institute of International Educators, the US Department of Ed and the US Department of Commerce. Um, nationally, one out of three students in higher education are first generation or second generation students. That means they are from family, they are either immigrants themselves or they are the children of immigrants who came to this country. Um, and that figure is growing. Uh, this is really important to take into account. Now, this, those same sources have researched every state's situation. In Vermont, the number of international students is 1,549. We have uh, massive contributions from their presence in higher education. Um, $73.8 million is the calculation based on, on like all of the fallout and um, benefit of having them in school. And jobs, they support 640 jobs in the state of Vermont by attending um, higher education in state. So the next question was, well, this is, you know, cause we arrived at this conclusion of like, this would be a really great thing, but is it possible? And so we looked into, um, into you know, what other states were doing um, and whether we could do it given like the federal landscape and, um, and our own state, state, you know, processes. And so I would like to share with you if I could, um, so how do I do desktop, right? And then... So here's a list, oh, there it is, of um, the states that allow students on the far left, allow students who meet specific requirements, regardless of their immigration status, to pay in-state tuition rates at public post-secondary institutions. And that's what our request is to adjust our statute to that. And that is basically 24 states plus um, DC. And then the middle, um, the, on, the, on the right, you'll see that um, these are states listed that provide access to state financial aid if you meet residential eligibility criteria. Um, and then I'll show a map here that um, kind of indicates, try to, oh, it, it basically shows that, uh, <laughs> that Vermont, the little blue over here, which we all know and love, um, we are one of very few states, if you look at where the rest of the blue states are, um, that basically don't have language. Um, on this and most of the other state, the red ones basically have prohibitive language that says we will not grant. Those are in the very small minority. The, and then most of the rest of the states have some kind of allowance, either if you are um, a DACA, like a deferred action, uh, you know, a, a person who was brought here by their parents and um, we grant you like a work permit. Um, some states will at least do like some kind of allowance for DACA students, some, but you know, in terms of like who else is in the same situation as us, it's very, very few states. And I would argue really um, not states that necessarily like parallel all of the other efforts that our legislation has, our legislature has taken on to extend like driver's licenses, um, regardless of migratory status and health benefits um, and the federal rulings that say that you can access K-12 education as a benefit um, and post-secondary education as well, federally. So that was um, really helpful uh, research to, to share. I can keep that up there. Um, uh, so yeah, and so then I pulled out, um, you know, took a look at all of the legislation for all the, the 24 states and DC and, um, and, and kind of read through it and consulted with um, um, our ledge council, consulted with um, uh, Maya uh, Tsukasaki, who gave uh, submitted testimony through um, the House Ed um, Committee website, um, as well as uh, Tanya Broder, who is at the National Institute um, uh, National Immigration Law Center. And she also was a consultant when we did the driver's licenses 
in our state for people regardless of migratory status. Um, and so the, the wonderful news was that through all of this research, we were able to collaborate alongside all of our institutions of higher ed, UVM, uh, you know, all our public colleges, UVM, the Vermont State Colleges, and VSAC, and we came to a really wonderful sort of partnership and uh, moved the ball forward, um, realizing that we all shared the goals. Um, we all valued the, the important contribution um, that these students can make and the potential we want to tap. Um, and there was some concern about confidentiality and, and protecting the privacy of, of students. And um, I found some language and we, we talked a little bit with um, uh, UVM was raising this concern particularly. And so that would be like the only added um, piece that I would say could go into the language that you will walk through. Um, and then if I could, I was just going to share with you um, some testimony from a couple of students who, um, who could be benefited from this. Is that? If it's relatively regular. Yeah. Here. Yeah. It basically, you know, if there's a student who's an 11th grader at Milton High School, I have one year left before I graduate. I'm nervous, but looking forward to it. After graduating, I would like to study to become a dentist. This has been a dream of mine since I was a little girl. Also, I've seen that my community here in Vermont, when it comes to dental service, struggles a lot due to many reasons, and that has inspired me to help and give back to my community. It saddened me to think that perhaps I won't be able to pursue my dreams after all. And then um, another uh, migrant student who, who shared, I arrived in Vermont when I was only 16 years old. I remember one of my dreams has always been attending a university and graduating, but instead I had to work really hard to support my family. We need Vermont to stand up for us, for our community, and to make sure that our dreams don't die on the farms. And so uh, with that, I thank you, I'm all set. And if you have any questions or if you'd like to move on to the language. That would be great, yeah, but let me see the committee. First of all, um, this is a, a big change from the bill that we had looked at previously on this. Um, and I think due to a lot of um, coming together of all the parties and, and hard work on everything, really appreciate that. It certainly makes our job a lot easier. We'll look forward to their testimony on this as well. Thank you. Yeah, well, I know that you guys are dealing with a lot of big stuff. So we tried to get do a lot of the legwork. Really, it really is appreciated. Very Thank you for much. hearing us out. Yeah. Thank you. All set. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Should I leave the Zoom? Yes, I mean it. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Uh, Committee show, we have Ledge Council run through the original bill one more time. It was relatively quick that uh, the one that Senator Hashim originally came in with about the new Americans, uh, the new American Educational Grant Opportunities Grant. That's just, yeah, run through real quick. Okay. You want the, uh, the bill is introduced yeah. or uh, passed by the Senate? That's passed by the Senate. Okay. Sure. Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. Um, can you all, I don't think you have it on your webpage. Can you all navigate to that? Do you all know how to do that? We do have it. We have it. Oh, you do. We have it. We, we have the amended bill. Yeah. Which I assume is what passed plus the new language. Yes. And I made some amendments based on our conversation from the initial walkthrough. So. Um, <laughs> I saw it. Yeah. Let's just go with the one that's on our website. Great. Okay. So um, we're going to walk through draft 1.1 of a strike all amendment to S191. Um, the first section, section one, uh, starting on line eight of page one, is from the um, uh, as passed by the Senate version. It is an amendment to the Advancement Grant Program, which is a VSAC program um, offering grants for non-degree education and training opportunities. You can see that in subsection A there. Um, what this section did is it allowed, um, and so remember there's a one-year requirement, a one-year residency requirement to um, uh, 
uh, be eligible for this grant along with other eligibility requirements. So what this section says is if you meet certain immigration statuses, you cannot be ineligible if, you're, if you haven't been here for a year based solely on that fact, right? You'd still have to meet all the other eligibility requirements, but they can't use the, the residency requirement against you if you meet certain eligible um, immigration statuses. And the bill is passed by the Senate referred to a whole separate piece of law where you would have to go and then find those immigration statuses. So I've just plunked them right in here. So you don't have to go look for them. So it's refugee, humanitarian parolee, and then a special immigrant visa pursuant to the Afghan Allies Protection Act of 2009. Any questions on that? Okay. Where are we? I'm sorry, I think I might have the wrong. I mean, I have the bill, but. We're in section one. Yep. Page two. No. Line one. Okay. Thank you. Yep. We're going to move right to section two, which is the incentive grant. Um, uh, eligibility. And I don't know, I don't know why I didn't make the same conforming amendments here, but I didn't. Um, this, <laughs> this is, um, this is a piece of session law. This was also passed by the Senate. This is a piece of session law, making the same amendment for eligibility purposes to the incentive grant program, which is another VSAC grant program. Advancement grant is non-degree. Incentive grant is a degree that you would be working towards. Same residency requirement of one year. This section says for the next three years, so there's a sunset built in on July 1, 2027. As long as you make all the other eligibility requirements for the incentive grant program, if you haven't been a resident of the state for one year, but you meet those same immigration statuses, um, they're not gonna hold that residency piece against you for eligibility. Um, I would suggest you ask me to make the same conforming amendments here so that people don't have to go look for them. It'd be great if you could uh, do that. Yep, great, thank you. I don't know why I didn't. Um, so that's what passed the Senate. Um, I believe that's, that's everything. Um, the way I've organized this amendment, if you scroll back up to page one, line seven, is I've organized the amendment by the institution involved. So this is all VSAC related language that we're walking through right now. We just walked through the only two sections to come over from the Senate with some, um, I would say kind of techni more technical related amendments. Section three is also related to VSAC, but new to the bill. So section three says, it's a, we're adding a brand new section to the VSAC chapter. Notwithstanding any provision of law to the contrary, I'm on the very bottom of page two, a resident who is otherwise eligible for a state-funded financial aid program administered by VSAC, and we're on page three, shall not be ineligible solely on the basis of such resident's immigration status under federal law. So VSAC, this is saying... If you are otherwise eligible for a state funded financial aid program, you check all of the boxes for eligibility. BSAC cannot say that you are ineligible for the program just based on your immigration status or lack thereof. Subsection B requires VSAC to establish procedures and forms that enable residents who meet the requirements of subsection A of the section to apply for and participate in state-funded student financial aid programs. Um, uh, the corporation may collect such information as necessary to confirm eligibility um, for participation in programs. And I think this is probably one of the sections where you may want some confidentiality language. Um, there's a rulemaking, so VSAC is um, required to adopt rules under the um, Vermont uh, Administrative Procedures Act related to this section. And then VSAC has to report back to you all in its biannual report um, regarding the impact of the section and the number of students who receive financial aid pursuant to this section. So you were suggesting that uh, the VSAC or where would that um, under the collecting information that we might want to add words in there to I think that's the I think that's a recommendation that 
that I think Rep. Dodge spoke to, you're gonna see it in all of the okay. subsequent sections, um, but I think that's a recommendation that may be coming from some witnesses. Um, we're on section four now, page three. We've moved to a different reader assistance heading. So now we're gonna be looking at laws that apply to the Vermont State Colleges Corporation. So this is, um, this is, um, there's kind of two parts here. One is new, one is um, some cleanup. So the first part in subsection A here on page um, three, at the very bottom there, starting on line 20. So the board of trustees shall adopt policies related to residency for tuition purposes consistent with state and federal requirements. New language, any policies adopted by the board shall not discriminate against or exclude a person based solely on the person's immigration status or lack thereof. If such a person would otherwise qualify for and meet requirements for Vermont residency for tuition purposes is set forth by the board and is permitted under federal law. Any questions? Okay. Um, and then um, page four, um, lines 13 through 19, I'm just making some um, technical amendments here to make sure that these references to federal law conform to our drafting conventions. So I haven't changed the law in any way. I've just added some language um, that should have been added when I drafted the bill originally. Um, Why is that necessary? Let me see, I gotta read C first. Why is, I guess I'm a little unclear as to why 13 to 19 is necessary because we speak to it above oh, is, is about the whole yeah. spread. It's a whole step. So it's the same language. Yeah. It's the same language throughout. It should all match now. Sure. Um, but you don't have to search for it now. It's one stop shopping no matter where you're going. Um, okay. That's it for, v for the State Colleges Corporation. Now we're going to move to page five to UVM. So very similar concept, although slightly different in the way that the statutes are formatted. So um, the state colleges language already requires um, the state colleges to adopt policies related to residency for tuition purposes. I'm actually going to ask you to uh, back up what I was thinking about. Uh, so under uh, the state colleges, uh, determination, determination of residency for tuition purposes, mm -hmm. um, it's just repeating in 13 through 19 mm -hmm. that for those specific categories, residency begins sooner than it could begin sooner, other um, different than what it would be for regular. If you do not fit one of those immigration status. Yes. yes. Yep. And that's current law. That's all. Subsection C is all current law. Okay. The underlying language is the only new language. Okay. And that is just drafting convention okay. with a federal law citation. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yep. Um, so page five, UVM. There, the law for UVM, so determination of residency for tuition purposes, um, it doesn't already require UVM to adopt policies related to residency for tuition purposes. So I added that language here. So Current law says enrollment in, at an institution for higher learning or presence within the state for the purpose of attention, attending an institution of higher learning should not by itself constitute residence for in-state tuition purposes or for the purpose of eligibility for assistance from um, BSAC. The Board of Trustees of UVM shall adopt policies related to residency for tuition purposes consistent with state and federal requirements. And then same language, any policies adopted by the Board of Trustees shall not discriminate against or exclude a person based solely on the person's immigration status or lack thereof, if such person would otherwise qualify for and meet requirements for Vermont residency for tuition purposes as set forth by the board and as permitted under federal law. And then the effective dates, the advancement grants and the incentive grant sections would take effect on July 1, 2024. And then um, the newer language would take effect on uh, July 1, 2025. And that is a holdover from the original effective date of the standalone bill when it was introduced. I don't know if that's still the desire. Correct. Uh, I, I guess I have a question uh, probably um, for Representative Dodge, and that would be uh, 
The, the basic concern that was brought up under the previous version of this in the bill was essentially, you know, on the website application process, it asked for a social security number. Does, does this, how does this solve that? Right, so um, currently the, 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 so our statutes don't tell any of our universities, it certainly doesn't speak in, in UVM's statute, there's, there's no mention of what the, res, what the residency requirement really is, except for the, you can't come here to study. Yeah. So you came here for your freshman year, that doesn't count as when you're a residency. Um, and so it just only, it only tells you what, what doesn't qualify. It doesn't mention migratory status. And so that's why like that blue, the, the blue states on that, on that map of our country, um, you know, we fall under that category. And so this, this, um, so your, if your question is how to, why do we need legislation? No, no, my question is um, to sort of, to, to the bottom, it seemed to me the bottom line of the previous bill was, was essentially uh, even though UVM and the state colleges say we don't care about immigration status and, and you don't need to put a social security number down, the problem was is that it still had an application process that asked for one, and that was putting people off. And I'm just wondering how this solves that very specific issue. If that, if I'm and if I'm wrong, and that was a specific issue. Yeah, I mean the. Um... The, the, the reason to adopt the language is to a signal to the colleges, regardless of administration changes or, you know, admissions, like internal discussions about what we want to do, like this protect, this enshrines the right, right, of, of uh, migrant students in our, in our state for publicly funded, you know, for our, our publicly funded institutions. Um, and the the removing of the social security number or, or whatnot, like those, we're not telling you how, or the statute isn't telling the institutions how they're going to carry out this non-discriminatory approach. It's, you know, we're, we're, we, so that's why we're not speaking to like, you can't ask for a social, or you can't, um, but we will try to add, try to add the language that says um, essentially like any, you know, student information obtained in the implementation of this section is confidential. And so that, you know, whatever, whatever they do collect, um, if it were to allow somebody to, to research, you know, students, there would be no way to identify who did have a social. I mean, there are many reasons why people don't have a social anyhow. So that in and of itself wouldn't necessarily be the challenge. But yeah, like there's both the, the process of applying if you don't have a social, you kind of would hit a wall um, in a lot of the application admissions procedures. And so I think this whole ex this whole process has brought about like this awareness of even if the institutions have thought, well, we want to do this. And I think we are doing this, are we not? Um, in the in the in the field, right? In the in the real world, students had no way of knowing that they could even apply. And um, and so having it in the statute means that, you know, the universities can, can put it on their websites, right? Just as like, if you look at UVM's website, their eligibility criteria for in-state tuition is spelled out way more than it is in our statutes. Um, and so now it would, it, would, it would go on their websites and they would be legally allowed to do so under federal law because now we have state language that defends that right. Thank you very much. Yeah. I need to say this out loud so I can get it, so you can help me get it clear, I guess. Um, we want them to be able to access ESAC money uh, before they reach the one-year status, if they meet all the other qualifications, right? So what if, um, what if someone moves into the state who hasn't been here a year, but does have um, you know, uh, status. Are they allowed? So the, there are two. There are, them? there are actually this bill has two different things going on. So uh, the sort of ability to be here a short time and qualify for for residential treatment is for a narrowly defined group of uh, what's called documented immigrants. 
Um, uh, these would be asylum seekers, right. uh, Afghan allies program. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember if there's another one. But so that's a very specific group. And then there is also language in here that says um, if you lived here, if you meet the same residency uh, requirements that all for anybody has to meet to get in fake tuition, and you're not in one of those special categories, but you're that you qualify for residency just like anybody else, regardless of your immigration status. I don't know if that's no, that that, that didn't, didn't help. Okay. Um, if I'm a, if I'm a resident of New York and have been for since I was born, yeah. Now I moved to Vermont and I've been here six months. Yeah. Um, and I'm not in one of those groups. Do I still get the same? You, you're, you should be just like anybody else. I don't, I mean, depending on what the rules so, are. So this group gets uh, special treatment? The Afghan allies and asylees who come here through those programs. Uh, so if I'm a student, um, I have a bad taste in my mouth. Shouldn't I? Wouldn't I? Uh, I mean, we have, I think we have passed legislation previously that not we here, but within the House that um, offer some of those residential benefits to folks who come here as there's, there's the Afghan ally program, which are these are folks who were who helped the U.S. effort in Afghanistan. They're brought here through a federal program. And then we have those who have refugee status who are brought here through a federal program. And the idea is to say, you know, you're here, you've chosen to be here in Vermont, you've come through a federally sponsored program and to, to sort of get them in that sort of Vermont mode faster. So, um... but yes, it is, it is a different situation then because if you're somebody who's Lives in New York and put in New York, you have access to all that, all those benefits within. But you have to be here a year. Yeah, you have all, all those benefits available to you in New York. What's that? If you're from New York, you have all right, those right. Benefits. If you're in any other state and move in here, yeah. Um, so I see that, and, and I want, I want, especially if the money's there, I want to be able to use that, and we want people to stay in the state. Yeah. I'm not against any of that, but I see discrimination against someone who's moved in and doesn't fit that criteria, it's not fair to them. It's not fair to someone who's lived in state all their life um, any differently. The money is being taken away for special group. Uh, well, I'd say that um, these would be good questions when we get testimony from those organizations. All right. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, question? Yeah, go ahead. Um, can, I, can I just add? Um, yeah. I think sure. that, I'd yeah. love to have you. Yeah, so, um, you know, we also we also make an exception to that residency, that one-year residency for our armed forces mm -hmm. uh, folks, right, who get moved around. And um, and so they, uh, you know, I think that you're, like, there's a, there's a pattern in terms of federal rules and what each state does. But essentially, you know, we're trying to recognize um, serious hardship and sacrifice that, like, contributes to our uh, to our kind of national goals, right? And so um, what's reasonable to expect, like if you are a somebody who was was an ally of the country, right, in a war torn region and you live in Afghan and you 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 know you're brought in to and you're kind of told right where to go. A lot of refugees are are told what, where they'll be settled. Um, right. And so I understand that, that that's and I accept that. that. I just, you know, uh, definition of uh, a struggling group. I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of people that struggle just to survive, not just military, not just these people, and to constantly separate them out and one be more important than another. Um, it just. Doesn't sound. We're not going to debate that now. Right. I appreciate your point of view. Yeah. So we have some. That's fair enough. All right. Other questions? We'll get some testimony from the uh, affected organizations. Otherwise, we'll close out this discussion.
and move into uh, the continued work on the task force commission or whatever you want to call it, as everybody now calls it, the task force or commission or whatever you want to call it. Um, Representative Brady's been doing some work with legislative council to kind of give us a, a framework to begin our a more structured conversation on this and I'll let you take it away if you don't mind. Great. Is that posted in the draft? Uh, sorry, but I sent the email. I will resend it. Beth's draft of the task force. Uh, it's coming. And another names. Was that? Can you change on the names? Well, yeah, yeah. but let's. Yeah. You do. Did you not get a copy of the email? I'll forward oh, it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I thought I copied you on a chain and maybe you an attachment for a while. Oh, I copied, I didn't even copy you, that's why. Yeah. Well, well, we're, Amazing how that works. Well, we're doing that. <laughs> okay. is, is our goal to try to get this accomplished and have it done to the yield bill of the We think to, so. Okay. Yeah, you know, we think that that's the best place because it sort of like here's the whole package of We've got a short. Uh, short, window. short window, lots of time <laughs> devoted to it in that short window. Are we taking testimony on it at all? It would well, we have been taking yeah, testimony. Yeah. I would take it in. So <laughs> we'll, we'll see if that's we'll it, see. It, okay. it's, up to, it's up to the committee in many ways. Uh, not yet. And it's, it's coming. Just, it's coming. Sorry, I goofed. Did not copy an email. Well, it always takes time to process through our system. Do you want to sort of? So, uh, yeah, I mean, I think Rob Taylor asked a good question. Just I uh, want to be fully transparent. So, like last Friday, uh, Peter learned never to leave before me. I uh, <laughs> happened to be sitting in here and was uh, chatting with Beth. And so I was like, yeah. I think we're getting there on some of the ideas here. And so we just went through what's on the whiteboard and reference that the select committee on higher ed has come up a few times now is like kind of a model of a process that's somewhat similar, but very different here. Um, and just like, oh, let's, maybe we should start getting something on paper to be looking at and knew that Ways and Means was working on the yield bill, um, was not aware until Tuesday that the yield bill would be a multi-year bill with potentially big funding formula changes in it, which is, I think, still to be worked out first in Ways and Means and then by the full body. But uh, basically, the only things we have to pass are the yield bill and the budget, <laughs> right? You know, the, less, the rest of this is sort of priorities. And so looking at kind of the time we have left, and particularly if the yield bill is going to do things relative to future years, not just the current year, which is typically what happens on a yield bill, all the more reason, or in my mind, like why these are, concepts need to, to stay and this work needs to stay together. Um, in fact, perhaps even rejigger the sequence of events a bit by the time the yield bill actually gets out of here. And that what I think, what I have heard, but again, please, like this isn't me telling anyone, this is asking, checking my understanding is from a lot of people, leave with the policy, money is the means, not the system. Like it's, you know, of course you have to pay for schools and taxes will go on and it's clearly a complex system. But if we're thinking about or, or wanting to see if this is sort of a moment of transformation, I'm not sh sure that a formula change really does that. It might do it in parts. It might have levers designed to do that. But, you know, I think especially in that first joint hearing we had with lots, with a whole, like, a lot of people from the education field came in. I can't remember the date exactly, but you know, repeatedly, I think, kept hearing, like, get the education sort of policy and system figured out, and then how do you fund it? Um, has been my kind of operating <clears throat> assumption, knowing, though, that it's hard to completely separate the two. And we're doing this all in real time where the funding formula just keeps on going and property taxes are what they are. So, like, we can't, we're not in a vacuum here. It's up. Like yeah. One more clar clarifying question. Yes, so, please. So with the, with the, whatever we're going to call this, this yeah. we're going to try to get this 
um, finished so it could get it possibly get on the yellow belt. Yep. Are we going to also still consider short term things that we could possibly put on with a different belt for this exception? I think uh, that's to just yeah. yes. Yeah, I, I, you know, I'm not sure what we have left that's available. Um, I think some of the things that you might be thinking of that are, uh, are maybe are already in the yield bill that has to be, you know, some, some of that short term like budget language and uh, I'll think that I, I skimmed through it. I'm, yeah, I think that there is some 2025 and 2026 items, you know, quick hit, perhaps not, you know, hugely impactful, but they're there. I'm worried about the excess spending. Piece. No, that's for then. I, I think that that's are we not, that's not on 2025? Are we? But we're doing walk through the bill, bill, right? So that we can look at it. That's what I was. Yeah, I, mean, I think that they have got a ways to. I, I you know we'll find out their status, but yeah, we'll, <laughs> and we'll have, will we have enough time like to go through that walkthrough so that we're actually part of the conversation if we feel that changes need to be made from an education policy perspective before it hits the floor. I'm just trying to get a hold of process within a few days, but I just yeah, I feel I, really weird like working on an amendment and not doing a walkthrough of the bill the amendment is being tagged onto, especially if it has to do with education. Yeah. So I'm just wondering if I could throw that out there as a concern. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, yeah, concerned? thanks for the concern. Yeah. Why and I'll get some clarification on the process. What? Why can't we just do 2020? It may go through. Ask ways and means. Well, I'm just asking, like you're saying 25, 25, 26, right? I, I'm, you know, having, I have read the bill. Uh, I don't understand in detail a lot of it. I get, I think, the sort of concepts. And I see that there is uh, some of the stuff we've heard a lot about in terms of 25, like cloud tax uh, to um, pay for universal meals. Uh, so, there's going to be an adjustment to the income sensitivity relative to everything else that's happening within the property taxes. And then there's some stuff for 26. I'm way on my lead here, folks. So if you're counting on my interpretation of the bill, I would find at least one other person to talk to you about it later today. But some of the things that we heard even at the end of our joint testimony last week, uh, like ballot language and clearly this excess spending thing has been in and out of the system. I don't fully understand it. I don't understand entirely how it's gonna interact with, there's a lot in flux right now in terms of the implementation of 127. And so there's a, you know, it's something I need to get my head around. Um, so I have, I, I don't, other than it seems like 25 is like, well, we have to, we have to do a yield bill for 25. 26 is maybe some short term, I think what that committee has been talking about, like interim steps. And what they have put in for 27, which I understand might be policy-wise where we're headed eventually, but to put us on a, a path to a new formula in 27 when we haven't resolved the whole kitchen sink to me feels like kind of cart before the horse again. So 27 feels like really a change in direction of where we're going. So. But I, I don't know what, you know, so why does 26 have to, to be in there? That is not up to me. And have time. I don't know what you mean by that. So not do project the 26 or 27, not have anything in the- uh, That's a, that's a, a but it's I'm, a means question. But do you understand the rationale behind it? I, I think mean, there's, it's to, I think there has, I would say there has been, you know, great um, sort of crying out to say, let's signal that we are taking on some of these, let's take 27 aside, mm -hmm. but that we are, we are to signal that we are taking some steps. I think the other 26 reality is that calendar wise, that's what I'm wondering. Schools, you know, they're, they're our like right. our budgeting. So if we don't do anything before we leave this year, it's yep. really kind of too late yep. for that 26 because they have to start. That right. doesn't mean that is not my endorsement or clear understanding of what's happening or not happening in 26 right. years. That's right. a yeah. process. Yeah. Yeah. You're making better sense than I am. No, no. That was helpful. Can I just add one thing? Yeah. Sorry. Um, so the the twenty the 27 language that's in the draft of the yield bill is um, uh, a little unique in some of the contingency languages. So yeah, people should definitely like take a deep dive into the draft and sort of, it's not... It's a little more, seeing for myself, it's a little more complicated than maybe on first pass. 
but just want to walk through it. Because I think it's pretty, pretty like, yeah. I'm not going to be inappropriate to to tomorrow morning. Yeah. Especially with such a short turnaround. Yeah. That's, that's more of a, I'm just flagging that for folks. Um, to be honest, I need to be again myself. So can we just go through it now? So I don't think, I mean, I, so there's, there's a lot of problem questions here that like, Many of us don't have the answer to. This is sort of you know unique circumstance. Well, I don't know. Are we having a joint hearing in the morning? Yes. And so okay. oh it's not? not? No, they canceled. Oh, they did. Okay. Because they're working on the Okay. Because okay. I'm like, I I wanted that kind of know what we're talking I guess about. I, I think they're working on it in real time and as like however we all communicate with other committees. You should share those things. We're not at right now taking a vote on this. I do not know if we're going to have possession of it in any way. I personally, yeah, I, yeah, I'm happy to talk about my thoughts about 27, but that's not like. But I think the, for the sake of our time right now, the, we all, whether it's going to be at a public caucus somewhere, somewhere, are going to need a real clear walkthrough of what what this is before people have to take a vote on it. Absolutely, mm -hmm. but if if we are, and it is sort of a question, if we are more or less coalescing as a committee around the short-term solution to the medium and long-term systems issues are to create, to put the right people at the table, to create the task force, to give it a charge, and to set in motion process before we leave here. But I don't, that's not like an agenda we have to, uh, I, I guess I'm asking, is that generally how people are feeling in terms of where, where we've been going with this. And I will admit early in the session, I was like, why aren't we just do like, just do the hard, you know, put, put some big hammers in, in bills. And I think it's through for me through a lot of testimony and discussion and that I have eased back into like a task force is perhaps a commission, a blue ribbon commission, a very different, better task force than any has ever existed before is appropriate right now. And the testimony this morning from Tammy Colby, for me, was affirming of that direction. But that's me, and I do not mean to speak for the committee. I just thought we had to like respond. I was just saying, do we have to respond tomorrow morning no. at the meeting no. to say that as a committee, no. you know, we don't support this. But if we have time, no. if we have time. No. I, I think, the task force definitely is something that needs to be put in place. I mean, that's absolutely got to happen, but I think it's a piece of the puzzle. And I would really so appreciate really diving deep into things that we might be able to do. I'll take a look at the yield bill to see if okay. that language is um, satisfying, but there's, there's got to be some things we can still do this session. I think we just need to, we need to dive deep and have some serious discussion. Okay. Are you it's definitely a piece, but yeah, will you bring feel free to put those ideas on the table to yeah, starting with this tomorrow morning? Yeah, well we'll yeah. we'll attempt to. I don't know. Yeah. Well this has to be submitted Friday, right? The you I, I think they, like the process of exactly because we're talking about a bill that's in another exactly how the process part I do not know and I'm not sure is entirely clear at this moment, but it is clear like the calendar keeps ticking by. And so at least getting that part, this part of it ready in our committee, exactly what the mechanics are going to be of how things physically attach to bills. I actually don't entirely understand at this moment, but I think, well, yeah. I think that's the easier part than actually what's in it. Like, what our media focus has to be on this. Right. Um, and that, and that, and that's it for the what day. he said. If we have another week. You know, I'm not feeling such urgency to have to do something. There's a little bit of breathing room. If we have another week before that bill has to be submitted, I don't, I don't know, but I don't think we have, I don't think we have a lot of breathing room. If you yeah. look at the calendar, where you know we are, well, I know it's either Friday. I mean, it's a deadline, Friday or the twenty second. So, so we're focusing on task force now. So yeah, we're, we're using the time we have done thing. We're focusing on it right now. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, no, that's great. That's okay. Great. <laughs> so <laughs> what may happen? Let's start to walk through the draft. Yeah. And. There, we have you till 4.15. I can stay till whenever. There, well, we want to get people out of here. It's a reasonable time, too, that nobody wanted you to say that. That time has really been a struggle. So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's walk through the language of what's here so far. Again, this was 
Beth putting in legalese, sort of roughly kind of some of the stuff on the whiteboard, some of the concepts and structure of the Select Committee on Higher Education. I know you've heard several of our conversations throughout the whole session about this stuff. So, but this is really, truly just a draft. There we go. Okay, Beth St. James, Office of Legislative Council. Um, this, uh, yeah, I cannot state it strongly enough. This is kind of me drafting this in my office at home uh, with no real direction. So other than the whiteboard. Um, so I fully anticipate you all will wanna change things. You won't like things um, to be efficient. I think it would be help. Well, do you want me to just walk through the bill or do you want me to pause and then we start pulling things apart as we go? Let's do a quick walk through the whole thing. Zero comments or questions. <laughs> Hold them and then we will go back part by part. And I imagine today we won't probably be able to go through all parts of it with some feedback, but maybe we can tackle a little piece of it. Yeah. And I will try and just say like, here's a major decision yep. point for you all as I go. Um, but that is exactly what I was setting you up to say. So thank you very much. Um, so first decision point, where are you gonna call this thing? I have called it a the Blue Ribbon Commission on the Future of Public Education in Vermont. Call it whatever you want. Um, so we're gonna start with the creation. There's hereby established the Blue Ribbon Commission on the Future of Public Education in Vermont to study the provision of education in Vermont and make recommendations for a statewide vision and goals to strengthen Vermont's public education system. I anticipate that that will need to be massaged. Membership, another huge policy decision. Commission shall be composed of the following members. This is basically just some common players um, and then some not so common players um, from previous conversations. But again, I fully anticipate this list will change. So Secretary of Ed, Chair of the State Board, two representatives from the School Boards Association, two representatives from the Principals Association, two representatives from the Superintendents Association, two representatives from NEA, the Chair of the Census-Based Funding Advisory Group, um, created under Act uh, 173, so that's special education funding, a faculty member from the University of Vermont's Educational Leadership and Policy Studies Program, um, and then the Executive Director of the Vermont Rural Education Collaborative. That's what I got so far. Um, the highlighting, I probably should have taken it out before I sent it to Annie. Um, this language is based on the higher ed, um, Select Committee, thank you, from a, a few years ago. Um, on or before, and that was a little different because there were actual institutions that could yeah. take part of and ownership and leadership over um, that group. Um, we don't have that in the public education system other than AOE and the state board, right? Um, so the, there's the, the whole commission and then the commission is gonna be guided by a steering group. So on or before June 29th, 2024, and I just took that date right out of the draft, the way that the, the higher ed select committee was set up. Um, this, uh, we're gonna have to monkey with the effective dates and, and figure out what's a realistic date there. So policy decision. The speaker of the house and the president pro tem shall jointly appoint three members of the commission and the governor shall appoint two members of the commission to serve as members of a steering group. So they're already on, they're already members of the commission. So it's almost like a subcommittee. The steering group shall provide leadership to the commission and shall work with a consultant to analyze the issues, challenges, and opportunities facing Vermont's public education system, as well as create a formal action plan to drive change and innovation in the public education system. The steering group may form one or more subcommittees of the commission to address key topics in greater depth. And then um, this language, I think, is kind of a no brainer, but it was in the steering or it was in the um, select committee's um, language, so I added it here. The commission shall seek input from and collaborate with key stakeholders as directed by the steering group. So, duties of the commission, this is basically taken right off the whiteboard. So, um, Again, lots of policy decisions here. So the commission shall study the provision of public education in Vermont and make recommendations for a statewide vision and goals to strengthen Vermont's public education system. 
Commission shall develop recommendations for the statewide vision by engaging in the following. So the first directive is that the commission shall conduct not fewer than 10 public hearings statewide to inform its work and shall provide opportunities for remote participation during each public hearing. Each public hearing shall be held in a different geographic region of the state with each different geographic region represented at least once. We've got more than 10 counties. Mm -hmm. We can't say there has to be a meeting per county. So if you have another way to signify to different geographic regions of the state, that'd be great because that's a really nebulous term. So I would think about that. Um, and the commission's work, I will just point out, is taking place over um, a couple calendar years. So 10 may be a low number over that period of time. So just thinking about that. Commission shall explore and evaluate potential changes that should be implemented in Vermont in order to improve educational outcomes and increase opportunities for all students. In exploring these potential changes, the commission shall consider the following topics. Governance, so I've kind of split it up into chunks just like we did for the um, school construction bill, only there aren't as many here. So the first chunk is governance, resources, and administration. So the commission shall study and make recommendations regarding education governance at the state level, including whether the role of the agency of education shall be one of compliance monitor, one of service provider, or a combination of both roles. Recommendations under this subdivision have to include at a minimum, whether changes need to be made to the structure of AOE, including whether it better serves uh, the education vision of the state as an agency or a department. What, oops, sorry, what, um, what roles, functions, or decisions should be a function of local control and what roles, functions, or decisions should be a function of control at the state level. The utilization of career and technical education in the larger public education system and what are the staffing needs of AOE, both in terms of quantity and quality? So we're gonna to move to the next chunk, which is physical size and footprint of the system. The commission, the commission shall study and make recommendations regarding how the unique geographical and socioeconomic needs of different communities should factor into the provision of education in Vermont. Recommendations under the subdivision shall include, again, at a minimum, the following. An analysis of the current number and location of school districts and SUs, and whether additional consolidation of either system is needed to achieve Vermont achieve Vermont's vision for education, provided that if there is a recommendation for any amount of consolidation, the recommendation shall include a recommended implementation plan. An analysis of the current public tuition program and whether and if so, what changes are necessary to meet Vermont's vision for education including the impact and consequences of public funds going to independent schools and other private institutions. The role of, uh, so that's the second chunk. Third chunk, the role of public schools. The commission shall study and make recommendations regarding the role of public schools should play in both the provision of education and the social and emotional well-being of students. Recommendations under this subsection shall or subdivision shall include at a minimum the following. How public education in Vermont should be delivered. Whether Vermont's vision for public education shall include the provision of wraparound supports, co-location of services, and what the consequences are for the commission's recommendations regarding the role of public schools, including what the role of public schools mean for staffing, funding, and any other affected system. Fourth chunk here is the Ed Fund. Commission shall study and make recommendations regarding what costs are currently borne by the education fund, what costs should be borne by the education fund, and what changes are necessary to ensure sustainable and equitable use of the education fund. And then the last chunk for consideration is just that catch all anything else. Reports. Commission shall prepare and submit to the General Assembly the following written reports. Um, a formal action plan. I think it should probably be a work plan. It was a work plan. I changed it to formal action plan. I think it should go back to a work plan. So they have to figure out what they're doing and report back to you all what that plan is, right? Let's hold them accountable. On or before September 15th of this year. Um, a report continuing policy decision. A report containing its preliminary findings and recommendations on January 15th of next year. 
and a report containing its final findings and recommendations on December 1 of next year. So you would get the whole kit and caboodle for the 26th session. Assistance, I'm on page six now. The Agency of Education shall contract with an independent consultant to provide technical and legal assistance to the commission for the work required under this section. For the purposes of scheduling meetings and providing admin assistance, they'll have the um, assistance of AOE. Meetings, the Secretary of Ed is gonna call, you need someone to call the person you need to order. It's gonna be the Secretary of Education on or before July 15th of this year. And then this language is taken directly from the um, Higher Ed Select Committee. The Speaker of the House and the President Pro Tem shall jointly select a commission chair. A majority constitutes a quorum, and then the commission ceases to exist oh, uh, on December 31st, 2025. Again, that's really a policy decision. Um, per diem, normal per diem. And then I added an appropriation to cover both per diem and the consultant, but I have no idea how much that would cost. So that would be a question for JFO. And then the act would take, this section would take effect on July 1, 2024, or depending on how quickly you wanna set things in motion, maybe even passage. My recommendation, but I genuinely am asking for feedback is that we actually start by diving into, um, before we get bogged down with the who's on it, um, that we sort of start at the bottom of page two, the duties, and then these kind of buckets of the charge. And then those help inform who is and is not on it. But we try to steer away from who is and isn't on it until we're clear about what it's doing. It's only one section I would have something to say about who's on it. And that's because it says that uh, three members from the Speaker of the House and the other, they should, should say not on the same party. So when they have- Yeah, and those aren't, so right now, there are no legislators on this. They're just picking people within the commission to be in the steering group. So we can talk about whether legislators should be on it. Yeah, because if they- so Right now, they're not even picking from legislators. They're just picking three. Right but we're not gonna go there now. We're gonna but go do these, right? I, my suggestion in terms of just our discussion is to start today is that we start going through the, what are the duties and essentially the charge of what this commission's doing. And we try to stay in that lane before, and maybe it won't be possible to separate them, but before we get back into who's on it. Can I start at a higher level? No. Yeah, or the very, very beginning. Yeah. Well, can I? Yeah. I'm just wondering, yeah. like in the in the creation, yeah. and there's a um, page two, e, um, we talk about what to do or just the duty. Oh, well, I guess we are going to talk about duties of the commission. There's nothing in any, either of these that talk about um, efficient operation. Sure. Um, and I think that that should be something that's a focal point of. What we're looking what, for. Is, should we start at E? Yeah, even Please? in the, either either that or even in the creation above. Uh, or do you want to go to the very very beginning? You know, the future creation. of public education in Vermont to study the provision of education in Vermont and make recommendations for a statewide vision. Um, I mean, I even think it, there should be something in there about the efficiency and provision of public education. Yeah, yeah, yeah. the efficient, efficient operation. Efficient operation. I mean, we that's. In my opinion, that's like a, a big thing that we need to be looking at is not only the vision and where we want to head with things, but the most efficient way to operate education in Vermont. I would say to efficient operation and um, uh, cost effective, but Janet just said quality, which I agree with, because we don't want to sound like jerks just being like efficiency money. Who cares about Yeah, no, is. no, so I mean, I, absolutely. Efficient. I think, uh, you know, there's a sustainable. Yeah. I mean, most of these are subjective, right? Like what's cost yeah. effective to you versus me, sustainable, all, all of those. But I also think a little bit about what oh, there's a word that came up this morning from Tammy Colby. Um, I love the three. Oh, come to me, sorry. I lost it. I lost it. Um, the Catholic section. 
maybe. Yeah, I, I guess I'm hoping we could really focus on like the meat of what's in it and what they're doing before we get yeah bogged down. Like the intent is really, I think, the part that makes us feel better. But like, let's we need to really get clear on what it is they're doing. Representative, well, you keep they keep coming up with costs. It really has to be cost that's sustainable. Exactly. Yeah, that's why. I'm, and it, somewhere in here, that's what it should say. Sustainable. Yeah. They come up with a plan that's oh. cost oh. sustainable. <laughs> Sustainable. I know the other thing that was coming to mind that is just that we like the system needs stability. You know, like kids, teachers and kids are doing great stuff every day, but like just the system. So stability, sustainability. We could have a whole bunch of lessons. <laughs> anyway. the, yeah, the system for sustainability and <clears throat> stability and sustainability. I. Um, Like you're saying, we can we could jump into the heavier the duty stuff and we can yeah. work. Yeah, some, work some in some ways, yeah. This is like the it's the intro is the easiest part. Like yeah. go back to that later when you <laughs> figure out what your paper is actually about. <laughs> but yeah. yes, clearly, no. There's a lot we want to get right here, so that could be like homework. For Let's time. yeah, keep, go home keep track of things. I just I I guess I'm confused because like <clears throat> on page. Or like line ten I. Let's can we go in order then? Because we're you know, it's jumping ahead pretty far. Oh, it's, yeah. I'm just it's just talking about um, the vision, you know. So whether additional consolidation or either need to achieve the Vermont vision. But I thought the select committee was figuring out what the vision is. So well, that's what right in A. Make recommendations for a statewide vision and goals. Like that's but the I very that's what the whole committee was going to do. Come up with a vision. Yeah, that it says that, right? But it seems like it's already you need that vision in order to carry out some of these. Um, right. That's why that's sort of why they're created. The very first thing, right? right? The page one ninety five says. But how are they going to come up with the vision if they don't get a ton of input and testimony? I don't think we're micromanaging a process here. I think we have to be very careful of that. I mean, we're setting up parameters. First of all, the stuff like exists all the time and we're giving, you know, talking about a consultant to help facilitate it. We're talking about a public engagement process, but I don't think we can get to like the micromanaging level of how many what meetings and every group you need to hear from. What and get, is like, the vision? I mean, that's, that's their charge. That's their charge. But it, but it also asks them to... Um, you know, are they just going to have one meeting and come up with a vision? Well, it's, a, it's just 10 public no, conduct no fewer than 10 years. Right. But then it goes on to say, um, along 10. I mean, maybe they then maybe we need to get tighter here about how they're the vision. But I, I guess to me, it reads like that's the very beginning because that's that's sort of where they have to start. But why they're being created is to create a vision. Right? Yeah. It, but and just if one was like sitting, that. just people sitting around without getting any input from anybody, so the they are. The Let's, I, I think we like, like what are you saying because you jumped to I, and we were not even on number one under E. So well, it we will get there. But okay, so it says the commission shall develop recommendations for statewide vision, engaging in the following. But then it continues on to talk about, you know, about what the vision is. So are they going to develop a vision and then? The vision needs to include all of these things. They have to make sure that. Um, but how do they? What? How do they get to a vision? They're the people who uh, work in this field every day. Really? That's why it's who we're putting on it. Yeah, that's the. But don't we see that's an echo chamber? I mean, we're not getting any new ideas in here about what the vision. I know. I think we can come back to who's on it. I, I guess I'm one. Not sure there aren't. We aren't getting any new ideas, and I think there are like some ideas that are pretty widely held and important. Like I, I don't, I, I don't think a direct democracy, like every Vermonter together comes up with a vision is a viable process here. In fact, I'd say it's like, we're, we're, we're struggling because we have so much local control over school budgets and schools right now. And we're trying to sort of elevate a group in a direction. And so 
Is this going to literally survey every Vermonter? No, I, I mean, I just think that this process without having a vision is a good process. So are you saying you want us to set the vision right now? No, I don't. I think the process is set, is I, I coming to the let's, vision. Can, can okay. I ask you to just table that thought okay. for like 15 minutes and yeah. see if things start to resolve a little? Okay, because it sounds like already it's just like the same old, same old, you know, maybe moving some things yeah. around. It's, it's by us specifying that you want them to have a vision statement before they hear anybody. And that's what right. you say. Right. And that's the way it's it's worded in this. Right. Because you can set, we could come up with a vision, but then we're going to go out back to each one of our towns when we come back. That vision won't be the same. No. Right. So and that's, that's what I'm trying to say. And that's sort of what you're setting this commission up for if you, if you look at the way it's written. Because it's saying, plan your vision, then hold 10 meetings around the state and listen to input and then come back and give us a report, which could be totally different from what their vision was in the beginning. And somehow, how do we tell them that we want them to do this study to come up with a better plan for overall education? And at the end of the process, we want a vision statement that says how we'll get there. Yeah, right. Yes. Uh, yeah. I think that's where like vision, mission and vision yes. processes drive me bonkers because I think we all get lost in the like, so like where I think some ways maybe arguing over some of the same things about like <laughs> big moving forward. And so I'm a little, I'm a little less hung up on exactly. It. I don't, it, it just because something's in an order in the bill, I don't think that necessarily in this language means that's exactly the order in which it's going to happen. Like all of this is an organic back and forth. It's not like they, they won't go to the bottom of page two until they've gotten through the top page one. But, you, but you're telling the committee specifically by this that they need to come up with a vision statement. And the question is, how do you tell them that, that they don't have to come up with it before they have their meetings and gather information? All right, let's I'm sorry. Can I yeah, please help? Um, this needs work. Yep. I believe the way this is written is that the end product is the vision. Right. Yes. right. So we have done. There's nothing in here that says sit down, create a vision in your first meeting, and they take testimony on whether everyone likes your vision. But then it references yeah. vision in you, yeah. you know, in the wording it could be a yes, clear. because they are working towards the vision. Okay. So they are considering all of this information in the context of their goal. And the goal is what is the, vi vi the vision for Vermont's public education system? And so when they are debating whether or not it should be a department or an agency of education, that their recommendations should be, whether it's an agency or a department, to serve the vision. So, whether they recommend whether it's an agency or a department is not because they like that, they think it's the most cost-effective or politically savvy. Their recommendation should be it's an agency or a department because it fits in the best with our vision for education in Vermont. But if the vision comes at the end, how can they have that problem? It's a puzzle, right? So each of these are pieces to a puzzle. Mm -hmm. yeah. but the, it's an iterative process. But yeah. I understand, okay. and we understand it because we're debating. What I'm worried about is the word that's on the document and the way it's saying it's telling them. Can you them, tell me what line you're looking at? I'm on page two, and I'm 17D, the yep. news of the commission. Yep. Okay. And if you look at it, they show study and provisions and so forth. If you read it, it sort of says, come up with your vision and then goes to straighten that public education. The commission shall develop, recommend ways to create, to do that vision. And it's the first thing in the line. By engaging in the following. Yeah, that's the key. That's, part. The, key, that's the key phrase there. So they come up with the vision by studying everything that comes after it. If I didn't have that phrase by engaging in the following, I think we'd have some work to do there. There's a lot of work that needs to be done here. But um, I hear your concerns. Um, I still think 
if you don't want to use the word vision, if that is, um, a, you know, a red herring, we can get rid of it. Um, can I ask a question? Are you stating, Nelson, that you would prefer to say the commission shall develop a statewide vision by engaging in the following as opposed to develop recommendations? I'm just trying to make the way, and it's confusing to me, confusing to her. There should be some clear way of stating what we're after. And I agree with you when I read the whole thing. But the trouble is people have a tendency like me. They don't read the whole thing. They're going to read it and think that, that, oh, they came up with this vision and now they're trying to tell us how to do it. So what I'm thinking is, even if it was just to make a recommendation for some statewide education system goals versus vision, and then comes down here and say the commission for the ballot recommend for the statewide vision. In other words, they're going to come up with the vision after they do something, instead of coming up with the vision first. That's the, the fear I have in reading this and putting this out somewhere where somebody's going to read it as statute or whatever. Good. They have this tendency because these things are pages and pages long. They skim to them. And we need to be clear on what we're trying to get done. And really what we want to do is this group to go out there, gather as much information as they can, and then come back with something that says the education system that we envision to be... Uh, what the three S's were sustainable and, <laughs> and so forth. It is this has to happen this way, and I think that's the sort of thing that we're trying to get in the beginning. Is what we're really telling people out there, not so much the commission. We're going to see to it that somebody does a study that comes back and provides the best information we can to come up with this vision that will be cost effective, sense sustainable and so on, because that's what they want to hear. The people out there at the moment say it costs too much, isn't sustainable, and they're doing all the opposite of what we want them to do. So you just, so, you just reword it. You so just rejigger it. The commission shall study the provision of public education in Vermont, develop recommendations, or sorry, forget that sentence, <laughs> um, strengthen Vermont public education system, and in doing so, we'll come up with a vision. Whatever, you just rejigger it. You just bump line, the last line into the middle of it, and then wrap it up with the same vision at the very end. See, I think it has to say, or it should say, but I'm not how do we deliver? Uh, so you're okay. We're starting to mix things, though. So we, I do like we. So this. We do need them to come back with more than just a mission. A mission no, no, is like no, a one-day no. one sentence. We no. need the actual recommendations of how we get there. And that's why there's these nice prescriptive buckets no. of what we're trying to walk through. What is the charge and what we want them to look at and come back to us with. I want them to look at how do we provide an excellent quality education for all children at an affordable price. I'll see. That, that's I, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a really hard time. I will say with affordable price because it's so subjective. Oh, okay, not a, so, okay. So not affordable price. Yeah, okay. I understand. Like cost effective, cost effective, cost effective uh, sustainable, sustainable, fine, um, efficient. I think sustainable use of statewide resources, but to say a, like yeah, yeah. affordability. Yeah, okay. But sustain. The question is, how do we provide a really good education for all our children? But that's yes, sustainable. Yes, but let's keep in mind. What I think we've been trying to do is to say, okay, what's the, what, what is the system that we, we want or need right now? And then how do you fund it? And not, because right now we have, here's the funding you have, so do what you can with it. And so if we're trying to reverse these a bit, you know, I think it's, it's, you know, when we get into the actual things, the size of the system, the delivery, those inherently get at the cost of things. But if we're just gonna keep, Focusing on the cost of them, that I mean, that's where we are right now. We could leave a statewide fund and say, "This is how much money you have. Do all the things you need to do, and then just please spend less of it." We're trying to say, "What's the system? What is the the thing we're trying to get to? What's the thing we're all excited about? The hopeful future of education, and then how do you fund it sustainably, equitably?" And the yield bill gives a pretty strong foreshadowing of what. Finance experts think we're going to do. <laughs> I don't think it's a secret. Yeah. If we could come up with a plan, yeah. the vision that says 
It's not only equal costs that we're doing out there for students, but we're providing equal education. It would be a major step in the yeah. state yes. to provide equal, whether it's up in Terry's property yep. or down in the middle of Manchester. Equal educational opportunity. Yep, I yes, have yes. a suggested edit that I'm getting to on the next page, but let's, in trying to, I'm going to say we take like 15 more minutes and then I think a hard stop just because we digested a lot and we're, we're spinning a bit here and I'm not sure it will be productive at a certain point. So for today, because we're coming back to this at 9 a.m. And the more we can come. I won't be here. Uh, I know, we'll, we'll be here. Well, that's right. We need to hash out probably some edits and then just come to some agreements on certain sections and then we'll send you the list. So lucky you. <laughs> you don't have to hear the process. You can I ask one clarifying Yes, question. please. Yes. So the goal is that we want this commission to create a vision and then actionable recommendations. No. I think we need to quit using the word vision right now because it's an activating well, word for this committee to go down rabbit holes. So maybe we like table that word. I wish we yes. could get like a print allocator just to yeah, have this. Yeah, we're on a realistic time. But that's what I hate oh, about this process. That's I, what I hate. I can't change that. We are here, like we're a part-time legislator here when we are. And I know, and know but it's just can change that. And this, these are the we're folks. Facilitated we're not, this, no, we're, I think we need a facilitator to come tomorrow morning and you know, ask how, what is the best, how do we get to a resolution where we're gonna get end up with what we want? Because I'm concerned about this getting us to where, where I, I feel like we could just do that, this in the, this committee. Uh, I would. I don't think we get any new ideas, you know, with this framework. I really don't. But you're gonna get a lot more public input. I, and, I, and to sell this, you need that public input. You need public input, and I personally think you need educational expertise. I do not think, and I would be worried for Vermont if we were going to create the education system in here. That is not our role, and that is not what we're elected to do. It, I, we already think that you did that, and it's costing them what it is. Right. I don't think they're not, because they are. Okay. We need we need that outside influence and we need that public input. And I think that's why this is a good goal. The question is, is how do we step it? If we zoom up a step here and like in terms of you know recommendations, yeah, I think we're caught between and you know, Rep, Rep Taylor, maybe we'll push us tomorrow morning of like, are we saying everything going on? Like do the hard things, either fund your DAs or take it out of the ed fund, uh, put in some class size minimums, get more bodies under uh, fewer ropes. Are we, well, well, so if we're not gonna do those, if there's a lot of input already, not just this session, but like decades on many of those things. And so if we're not, you know, if we're saying we're, a, we're responding to the challenge in the moment and the confluence of things and because it's so big and complex, we're not gonna just put them all in bills to pass out of here, because this is the easy part, putting it on paper. The hard part is what people have to do outside this building to actually put it in to work. If we're gonna say, we're gonna set up a process because we know big, hard change is coming and good change too, like that we're going in a modern direction. We are gonna set up a process to start getting us there. I don't see how this doesn't have some deliverables about otherwise why why are we doing it if they're not giving us some deliverable recommendations i mean i think yeah. the biggest thing we have to do challenge is to get buy-in from the public because in terms of why we're doing these very hard things well the very hard things that not are buy -in. Back are we buy -in? and that's when and that's when we'll have we'll need the buy-in and the political will like the task force's report or whatever you know these things are not these aren't elected officials these aren't you know the stuff that's going to come from this is going to be groundwork that has to happen on the ground in schools so you need school leaders who can do it and support it and sustain it it's probably going to be some political decisions that we're going to have to make that are going to be hard and messy and going to require some political will I don't I mean I think this I think this is great for the overall vision and some of the, the bigger conversations. I think we do need to look at who we have, who we want represented representing 
the board yeah. as in people because I do I do agree with this really right it could turn into an echo chamber we've got like we need some fresh eyes I think in there yeah. that can look at things with a different lens than yeah. having been in it the whole time um so I those are that's one thing I definitely want to look at but the hard stuff like we have how many people have told us that our class sizes are not appropriate why do we need to put that in the task force for them to waste their time when we already know that we've been told by people over and over and over again why can't that be something we take action on we'll leave it out of the task force there's there's an absolute place for this task force to look at this the overall system as a whole and figure out how we're going to go um but, it, but there's it, things we know are it'd be helpful for the public it came from the public the public said you need to consolidate schools you know then you can say we heard from the public and there's going to be people that are going to be very against it. There's Absolutely. always going to be people. That I don't think that we're going to make a decision here this year to start consolidating. No, schools. no, no. That's something no, that's going no, to be no. in here, and they're going to get public right. input. Right. I think there's things and there's things that we can do this session that we've heard over and over and over again that we can pull the trigger on. Yeah. And we should instead of giving it to a task force and waiting on it, and we already know what the solution should be. Mm -hmm. Consolidation is not one of them. That has to be. For them to look at in the bigger picture we know that it's got to happen mm -hmm. but how to effectively do it in a state like vermont with a rural system that we have is the question so yeah and this a lot. Require the public i know i but i want the public to feel like we're taking their input and using it it's not like we're here's the vision what do you think it's more like you know or maybe some components of it well, all these, this will be open meeting law. Well, all these 10 yeah. meetings. Yeah. It'll have to go here to open meeting law. Right. That's why geographically. But, but what will we be asking them to I do? Think, I mean, yeah, I think we should ask. That's the task. Like, that's their first thing is their work plan. That's not up to us to decide. We're not managing this process. We are not a school board. And we are, like, and we are setting up a, and we absolutely need to get, you know, deep in here and figure out who is on it, what perspectives and why, but we are not ultimately doing this. Oh, no, I know that. I understand yeah, I that. Then why is it in that, that thing? I mean, because- What do you mean we, it's part of that? It's in this, this document. It's in the document. It You're saying, you know, should we do, you know, geographical or- It's already in there. You know, it, 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 it's trying to signal some like, don't just do this in Montpelier or Burlington, like go all over the state. I think well, I thought it was looking at rural schools and urban, you know, and just the, I hope other than the it's specific it's organization, the word rural or urban should not be in here. I, I, <laughs> think, rural, I, think, rural, rural what, I think what we're trying to do yeah. by this list is make people aware of things. It's not someone saying, here, you got to look at this specific thing. We're saying, here's the things that we know about and are aware of. Yeah. that you probably should look at. But that doesn't mean that they can't look outside of this. Absolutely. That's, or, or that's the thing right here, yeah. Can we all take a look at this tonight? Yes. Deeper. Yeah. <laughs> Come back tomorrow with ideas that we've thought about because we need to have yeah. something almost solidified tomorrow, really. I mean, we got yeah. a little time, yeah. but yeah. if we can get something that can just be like little edits here and there after that, we're on the right well, track. I would we know if we need it tomorrow or in a week. Because if we need it tomorrow, it's just like, I mean, think about the tasks we're doing. I mean, we can do it, but I, I, I'm, I'm really concerned no. about that. I think we need to do our best. I think it takes a lot of talking and a lot of thinking and a lot of reflecting. And if we're rushed, then I'm concerned about the outcome. Well, yeah, I think we should have an 80 to 90 percent done document tomorrow. Right. That's my, that's and my point. You don't. That I think be. we should. It, 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 I, I like that. I like that. Right. And I then mean, it can take as long as we give it. So if we, we, give it yes. we will talk it to that. Yes. We have a deadline. You have to and if we that. have more time after that, fantastic. We can start looking at it. But again, I would, like this isn't meant to be a spring. I know that like actually seeing some language on the page, which is why I just wanted to, we wanted to start getting something out there so we can react to something. But these are the concepts, the ideas, the challenges, the short, the medium, the long term that that we've been talking about and getting testimony on for for weeks. That's been the you know, and and there's a fundamental decision here about for all of us, not really, or not just the House or this committee by any means. Like, is are we enacting the policy changes that just tackle some of the problems head on? If you can even do that in in one year.
or are we setting up a process to do that? Like, but if we're setting up a process, we really don't have that much more time to set up the process. Like we've been hearing about who, what, what the issues are and kind of what some of the paths ahead might be. And so if we're going to set up a process, then we're like this, it's go time for us to set up the process. That sounds great to me. I mean, I can't imagine any other entity doing that in one day. I mean, maybe you can. I mean, but I just feel like- I guess I just don't think we're doing it in one day by yeah, any stretch of the imagination. Like that's been up there for a week and that was after, you know, weeks yes. of like, I, I don't know, my notes, my, my one page, my document of notes of every single person who's come in to talk about the system is like 18 pages of notes right now that goes back to February, so. And, and these big concepts, like even consolidation, we were talking about last session, when we were talking about school construction, Rhode Island came in, yeah. talking about the way, the new and viewer, that came from a tagline that was used by yeah. Mario, or whatever his name is, from Rhode Island last year. So these are not new concepts. Yeah, consolidation's gonna be, be bold. if you look at that list, my school, one of the schools I represent is second to the smallest. It's got 28 students. The only other one is 22. And that 28 students is probably less than five miles from the other school. And it's not uphill and downhill, it's straight down. I have a question about sort of things are quite like do we want to force a decision on those communities, or do we want to say, here is the big future vision we are all moving towards as Vermonters? And as we get to get there, there's going to be some things along the way instead of that will be hard. CVSD may need to not have certain, you know, co-curricular things that they're able to offer right now. Those two schools might need to merge. Their teachers need more training to be able to better teach students with special needs. But do we want our, our you know, there's, I think, a real like political decision. Are we comfortable just saying Ooh, make the hard choice, make the hard choice, make the hard choice. Or are we saying there's a reason and something we're all moving and rowing towards of why we're making hard choices? And one of four schools that have all merged in Act 46. That's one. Now, they didn't close the school. In fact, I don't think any of them, North Benning went on its own. It became independent. But the, but the others did not. I know they talked about it, but they didn't go through that hassle of doing it. This school might do that, but I know that, uh, you know, it's a mountain school. It, it, it's what it is. And uh, the real question comes down to, is it cost effective if that school closed? Because the principal teaches, plus the teacher. So when you're done, because you're not going to save any money by moving the students around because the tuition is going to go wherever it's going to go. That money's there. So it's really the administration side of things. And that, that that's um, the affordable piece. You have to do it so that it's affordable, sustainable, whatever. That, yeah. that, but the thing that we're all moving to, is that decided at the beginning? Or when is that? What is that that you're talking about? I know we, that's what this group's doing. Okay. That's the job. This group is like charting the vision in the future and some of the pit stops along the way, the you know roadside stops along the way to get there. And probably some of those roadside stops are going to come back to us in the form of bills that for whoever's here might be really hard. But not all of them. It's not, I don't think all of this happens for legislative action by Thank any means. Here. <laughs> this, we may still be here in our seats talking about this bill, possibly. <laughs> you know, I mean, live and die here. Yes, go, go away, yes, mine, come in. Close us out. Um, I'm just going to be realistic about my time. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, Ways and Means has me booked for almost the entire day tomorrow. Yeah. Um, including right up until the end of day. I'm only available until 4.30 tomorrow. So, and then they have me booked from all afternoon on Friday. And I suspect I will be getting an invite for Friday morning as well. If you have language changes, it would be helpful that there is a point person or two um, who either schedules a time to meet with me to talk through them or I get them in writing. 
And if you are interested in pursuing an amendment, an individual amendment to the yield bill, please send me an email or come and talk to me individually. Um, if you all, if let's, if the if the yield bill is going to be voted out of Ways and Means on Friday, are you considering this language as a, an, a floor amendment offered by everyone? Being still worked out, I think of how that would happen. So I don't know. So it's possible. It's impossible that you would give, there is a universal possibility that you would give ways and means language to add on to the bill that they vote out on Friday. There is a universal possibility. I don't know procedurally exactly how that happens. Okay. And there's no other option. Well, hold on just a second. Are, Chris, are you comfortable if you and I become the like keepers of the edits and the changes and the that we have to agree on everything, mm -hmm. but like the process here. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we will be the conduits back to you of information. And if it seems like it needs a talk through more than just notes, we'll set up time for that. But otherwise, just an email, send you the feedback as we work through it. I think that most of our questions are really going to be more policy decisions. We just have to make not legal decisions about the working mm -hmm. sense of where. But I could be wrong. Um, I will do my best to pop in if I know you were talking about this and I am not in reason. And Annie can text us all if like some opportunity. Annie's doing an, a phenomenal job of <laughs> stalking the ways and means agenda yeah. and booking me anytime yeah. they have something else on their agenda. Yeah. So um, she's really looking out for you all. So Beth, do we officially have you back anytime on Thursday or Friday, or are we just like looking for our openings? So <laughs> you officially have me a couple times Friday morning. Oh, okay. Tomorrow, I have accepted an invite from Annie based on Ways and Means agenda right now. But my, I also have an invite from them from nine to noon tomorrow that has not been edited. And those those changes are happening kind of in an instant. Um, so it's tomorrow's a maybe, Friday's a definitely. Okay. Because you are the attorney architect of the old bill. Is that right? No. No? Okay. I am one of the, I do I not do the yield bill. Right? The Kirby. tax attorney, Kirby okay. Keaton does, but there is a education spending and finance straddles both portfolios. Um, and there is some ed policy in there. Do they have to have that out this week? Is that, so is that why there's a big push? What's the timeline for that? Um, I don't know. What's that? What's the timeline for them to have this deal fill out? It seems like they've got a really big push on it right now. I don't know well, if, it it, if it was a normal yield bill, they say not. But because it's a 24-page yield bill with lots of changes in it, I'm sure it'll spark lots of stuff over in the Senate that we probably wouldn't mm -hmm. normally have. I mean, I think the reality is we're already late. Like in yes, a normal sorry. year, yeah. in a yeah. normal and year, the budget bill you know, would have moved. Right. We still don't have, you know, we have less budget, yep. hard budget info than ever before. So they've been waiting for that for a good reason. Mm -hmm. Then point. there's a whole process thing, you know, approach the floor, the Senate. Yeah, the, 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 like there's a long way for this to go in about a month. I get it. Yep. Yeah. We yeah. got a long way to go yeah. and yeah. a short time yeah. to get there. Yeah. <laughs> yep. Okay. Sing us out. And tomorrow, <laughs> when we're when you start like singing it, that point needs to be trying. So like, that point you cut it off tomorrow. That's the, like okay, stop, stop. That point has been. I like, get out the banjo. Music on four Musical cues, and it's eat. Okay. Yeah. I right. just keep reading. Oh, like the, the, the kind of award ceremony where they like shoot. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're done. You're done. You're done. We're building the car. All right. We're yeah, we're